Welcome to the third of our Provocations in Transport lectures. Um, and to remind those of you who have been to this before, in case you have forgotten, because it's a new year since we did the last one, um, the idea of this series is actually to create a, an arena in which we, we think the unthinkable and say the unsayable and um, really try to challenge the world of way, the way that we think about something like transport and what it is and how we do it and whether we do it and all of those sorts of things. The idea of the series is really to leave us with questions ringing in our ears and not necessarily answers. And I think um, to change the way that we think, that's actually a very important thing to do. So tonight we have Ed Parsons, who um, comes to He's the geo geospatial technologist at Google. Um, and he is essentially organizing the world's information using geography. It's a, it's a Google climb kind of thing to do. Um, he works a lot with governments, universities, research and standards organizations, basically anybody who is involved in the development of geospatial technology. He's a member of the board of directors of Open Geospatial Consortium. He's a visiting professor here. Um, He's also an executive fellow at the University of Aberdeen Business School. He, before going to Google, he was the first chief technology officer in the Ordnance Survey. And before that, he was at Autodesk, where he was an applications manager for the GIS division. Fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, associate fellow of the Royal Institute of Navigation, and the professional member of the British Computer Society. Um, and as if that isn't quite enough, <laughs> He's a lapsed aviator. So I think we should see the aviation. Um, after all, this is a provocation in transport. Absolutely. So not the lapsed bit, but the aviation bit would be really cool. I can't think of anybody better to provoke us um, for our third lecture. So, Ed, thanks very much. Thank you so Cheers. much. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, good evening, everyone. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be uh, back here at UCL in a, in a different lecture theatre. I, I prefer this one to the other lecture theatres I've been. It's a, good, it's a good view from here. That makes a difference. Um, I'm going to spend the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour or so trying to provoke you with ideas that perhaps you will think far-fetched, science fiction, impractical. Um, that's great, because I'm willing to, to argue those points with you towards the end. And in some cases, you may be right. But... I want to suggest you know, where the potential of, of technology is in this space of mobility, transport, uh, what we're all interested in, and what is going to be one of the, the major challenges for, for the world moving forward. You know, we have a growing population and a population that wants to move. Um, so I'm going to talk about the informed traveler from intelligent maps to flying cars. And I'm deliberately uh, putting onto my slide a uh, a toy from my childhood. I'm not sure how many people in the audience are old enough to remember uh, a Jerry Anderson series called Joe 90. Anyone remember Joe 90? For the old folks, perhaps. Um, Jerry Anderson's probably most well known for Thunderbirds. That was his big series. He also did a, a less successful series uh, called Joe 90, which was about a nine year old boy. And obviously, you couldn't make a series like this today with our modern political correctness. About a nine-year-old boy who was a part-time spy uh, who got sort of lent out by his dad to an American defense and intelligence organization um, to go and spy. And obviously, he was a perfect spy because no one would believe a nine-year-old was a spy. And what he could do was put on a special pair of glasses, and those glasses gave him... Uh, knowledge and insight that he stole from other people. Um, so you could you know, get someone's intelligence, their knowledge, recall that on a magnetic tape, and via that magnetic tape you could download it to Joe 90 and he would have your knowledge and your expertise. And of course, the thing that most impressed me as a child was he had a flying car. And I'm still disappointed today you know, all those years later, that we don't have a flying car yet. Not quite yet. So, a bit about me. Note the glasses. Yeah, Joe 90. Uh, I'm a, an optimist. I'm a technologist. I believe technology is going to, to make our world better and continues to make our world better. 
obviously, most technologies have two sides to them, but I'm always going to be the guy that's, you know, glass half full. I think the technology that we are developing is going to improve things. And that's really going to be kind of the main proposition. I'm going to say, actually, we can use technology to solve many of the mobility issues that we have uh, moving forward. As you heard, before uh, I came to Google, which was about 11 years ago now, I worked for Ordnance Survey. And my career as a geographer started again when I was a child, a little bit probably post my, my Joe 90 years, uh, when I went on a field trip to South Wales. This is the River Usk. And I spent most of my time jumping in and out of the river, uh, making flow measurements, and typing those flow measurements into an Apple II computer that had a model of the catchment, and we could uh, estimate uh, flood events based upon that model. And I loved this. It was the, the connection of maps, which I'd always loved, and computers, which was a, a kind of newfound passion. And I'm going to argue that that knowledge of the world around us in a digital form, in its modern sense, not necessarily a traditional ordinate survey map, is a foundation to allowing us to build the flying car. And this is a real flying car. Uh, this is Cora, and I'll talk a bit more about Cora a little bit later on. And OK, this may not be the solution to our mobility problems in London. I think it's going to be a while before we have one of these parked in our gardens. But what that represents in terms of its use of technology and information that it uses uh, to operate, I think is a piece of solving our transport problems. Because it regards information as an infrastructure. And I think this is the key point. We probably will struggle over the next decade or so to invest in huge infrastructure projects like Crossrail. There are only so many underground lines that you know, any city anywhere in the world can really uh, build with the, the incredible amounts of capital that are involved in doing so. For a lot less money, we can build information infrastructures that share information about how a city is operating, how people are moving around that city, about the local climate, about how people are working, and we can add flexibility potentially into the work patterns so that we don't need to build these big infrastructure projects anymore. We can use the infrastructure that we already have, and the infrastructure that most cities already have, more efficiently if we have more information about them. And this isn't a pipe dream. This isn't something that relies on new technological developments that we, we need to solve problems we, we don't know how to yet. We largely know how to build information infrastructures from a technology point of view. I guess what I'm going to question, and I'm really going to be interested in your uh, feedback at the end, is, well, what are the societal and policy issues that we also need to overcome? Because I perceive those to be potentially uh, the bigger blocks. So that's the introduction then. Let's get into it. And I'm going to have to obviously talk a little bit about Google Maps, because they pay my wages, and that's what gets me here. So kind of small piece of advertising, if you like. So this is Google's mission statement, to organize the world's information to make it universally accessible and useful. And there we see Larry and Sergey uh, in their garage in Palo Alto within probably about three months of starting Google as a company. They were both students of computer science at Stanford University, studying PhDs. Any PhD students in the audience? No? OK. I always have to ask that one because they are both failed PhD students. <laughs> they both dropped out of their courses and said, well, you know what? Actually, we'd much rather be billionaires. Well, you can probably understand that, I guess. It's probably also quite useful that if you are creating a startup, to start up in a garage. Most great American startups have started in their garages. Hewlett Packard, Apple, it's the thing you do. So as long as, you know, as long as you get your funding, find a garage somewhere and you can start off. Very early in Google's history, this mission statement was defined. And it remains the mission statement of Google to organize the world's information, to make it universally accessible and useful. And that's still what we do. So why is Google interested in geography then, particularly? Well, 
it helps to answer questions, doesn't it? Google is mostly actually about asking questions. Once upon a time, actually not that long ago, Google was about answering questions by providing you with a list of web pages that you could go and then find information on that web page that potentially answered your question. We've got more sophisticated as time has gone on. The web itself has become more sophisticated, more structured. There's more knowledge now on the web, and often we can answer the question directly. But it's still a challenge, finding the right piece of information that's going to answer the question that you're asking us, or more and more we're thinking, well, here's some information that we can provide you with even before you ask the question, because we know about you and your habits, and this is the information that you're probably looking for. From a Maps point of view, obviously, people think in terms of Google Maps. This was the launch of the iPhone uh, way back in 2007. And it, Google Maps, or the Maps application, was one of the, the applications that was demonstrated by Steve Jobs. And if you've never seen the launch of the iPhone, it's really worth searching for it on YouTube. And obviously, other video sites are available. But YouTube's really going to be the easiest one to find it. And watch it. It's a master class of how you present technology. It's also a master class of how you present technology, even though that technology doesn't necessarily work. So, much of what was demonstrated when uh, Steve launched uh, the iPhone was smoke and mirrors. You know, he supposedly dialed a local Starbucks, but he didn't really. Um, and if he searched for anything else or anywhere else, it wouldn't have worked. But nevertheless, it was one of those things that really caught people's imagination. Because it changed what a map was. A map, historically, had been something that was relatively static. You produce a map, at some point you print it, and that map then remains static for the life of the map. But with a map online, on a mobile phone, the map becomes dynamic. It becomes something that changes in real time, potentially, to reflect the world. It's no longer a static document. It's a mirror of what's happening in the real world. And that's really what Google Maps is today. It's a map, but not necessarily as we might think traditionally. It's actually a, an interface, a way into finding knowledge about the world around us. And the increasing drive, the focus of all the, the mapping companies online about making that information, making that map real time. So if I use Google Maps in my car, I can avoid the traffic. And we'll work out, I'm sure most of you worked out how this works. Uh, up until uh, already, but I'm going to focus on that as being really important. So I'm now not looking at you know, the traditional route map or the A to Z. I'm looking at a reflection of the world around me that is updated probably on average around every 20 seconds. The map is refreshed to take into account the environment around you. If you're driving, it's looking and sensing using other users of Google Maps information about how the traffic is flowing. So you'll always get the fastest route. Always trust Google Maps. It knows better than you do what the quickest route is. But likewise, if I'm using public transport, it will also get me home based upon the conditions on my local transport network. Again, all the mapping operators out there, ourselves, Apple, here, we reach out and we work with the major transport agencies, TfL here in London, uh, RATP in Paris, whoever, BART in San Francisco, to get real-time information about how a network is operating. You know, what's the schedule? Actually, how is that op network operating today in real time? And that information, again, is presented to you via that mobile interface. And then, you know, if you want to go and get a pizza somewhere locally, you can do that. How many people here have used a Maps application, be it Google Maps or Apple Maps, in the last 24 hours? Yeah, probably all of us. Maps are those applications that we come back to again and again because they provide real value to us. They provide real value to us, and it's a value that we get for no charge. We don't pay to use Google Maps. We don't pay to use Apple Maps. But there's real value associated with them. We did a study last year. And on average, the value of Google Maps to a family in the UK is about 300 pounds per year in terms of time saving. 
of not being in congestion, uh, not being stuck on the tube, and so on. That's a real value. That's the real value to people. And that represents mostly a time saving, but clearly there are other spin off benefits of people not sitting in traffic, you know, with their cars running and polluting the environment, and so on. There are also some other interesting values that come from the provision of information that um, are perhaps surprising. I like this one. People perceive public transport to be operating more efficiently if you provide them with information. So people think there is a two minute less waiting time for buses if you're providing them with that countdown information as opposed to not providing them with any information. This is a perception. It's not real. The buses aren't necessarily more uh, on time. They're not necessarily operating any better. But there's a perception by making the information available that the service is better. Certainly, there's a lot of research that we've done in the States that um, suggests that people are much more willing to use public transport if there is information available. One of the main reasons that people don't use public transport is that unknown. You know, you turn up to the bus stop, and if there's no information, have I missed the bus? Uh, you know, has it just gone past? What time's the next bus? Are there problems? Having that information available reassures people and actually makes them think, in many ways, the network is working better. And here's another surprising fact. All of you, uh, not surprisingly, recognize the value of Google Maps. You use it every day. Actually, the country with the most Google Maps users in the planet, on the planet at the moment is India. There are more Google Maps users in India than there are in the United States. And how they use Google Maps actually is significantly different. The main way that you travel, if you've got your own transport in India, and actually it's the case in most of Africa as well, is you travel on two wheels. You have a bicycle or you have a motorbike, you know, a 50cc motor scooter. And we have a version of Google Maps that works specifically if you're on a motorbike, because the constraints, the things that will slow you down if you're on a motorbike are going to be very different to those if you're in a car or if you're walking. But that's extraordinary if you think about it. There are now more Google Maps users in India than there are in the United States. OK, so that's the world as it is today. I'm going to dig now a little bit behind the scenes and say, OK, there's some real significant benefits of making this information available via things like Google Maps, and it is in some way changing people's behavior. But let's, let's dig a bit deeper and actually understand more about the technology that's there and where that potential technology might go. And this is a concept that I call ambient location. And what ambient location basically means is that we have a capability today to know where we are continuously but also to know where things are around us continuously in real time. So think of it as almost a sort of a nervous system for the planet. Where things are moving, we know where they are, largely because we're using all of these mobile devices that are connected to the internet. So this is somehow, I suppose, related to the internet of things. But it's a dynamic, very dynamic picture of people moving around, and devices talking to each other and reflecting how the world is at any particular point in time. This is a capability that is relatively new, quite radical, and we're still really coming to terms of what this might mean in terms of the provision of information. Because we've never had this ability to have that, that nervous system, to actually understand how people are moving in real time. We don't have to rely on paying a pensioner to sit in a deck chair at the corner of the street with a clicker counting cars as they go past. If any of you thought that as a career choice, sorry, not going to work. It's based on something you're familiar with, that little blue dot that appears in the center of Google Maps or Apple Maps or whatever you want to use. That blue dot is hiding a lot of sophisticated technology behind it. It's using uh, GNSS, so the GPS and Galileo constellations of satellites to provide you with your location uh, within probably five meters or so if you're outside. But in urban areas, if you're inside, 
were probably using a local Wi-Fi database that were sensing the local Wi-Fi hotspots like this and picking up their signal strength and being able to identify whereabouts you are inside the building or in a, an urban area. There's a new development in Wi-Fi technology that's coming uh, online now that actually means that these Wi-Fi hotspots work a bit like a GPS satellite, and they actually measure the time the signal takes to get from the Wi-Fi hotspot to your phone and back, and we can therefore measure much more precisely where you are indoors. That's going to allow us in the near future to do indoor navigation in exactly the same way that we do navigation outside. At the moment, we can't do that because when you go inside, we lose the GNSS signal. So that blue dot, that's part of it. That blue dot knows your location in absolute terms, in latitude and longitude. And if we connect out to various databases, it knows where you are relative to other things. The real value, though, comes when you don't look at just one dot. You start to look at the population of dots. You start to look at where all of the dots are in a network. What you have to do, clearly, is you have to ask the owners of those dots, the owners of those devices, do you mind contributing some information for the good of the whole community? Can you share your location with other users of your application to make that application work better? That's the deal that you do when you sign up in Android or in Google Maps and say, yep, I'm happy to share my location anonymously. Because sharing your location anonymously is allowing that network of where people are to operate. What you're doing is you're contributing uh, probably every few minutes, depending on how you're moving, your speed and where you are. And we can also use some of the sensors in your phone to work out how you're moving, whether you're walking, jogging, you're on a bicycle, or you're in a vehicle of some sort. But there's a network effect. The more people you've got contributing this information in real time, the more powerful that value becomes of the network. And that's Metcalfe's law. If you've ever done any uh, computer science, you'll be familiar with this. It's the value of a network increases with a square the size of the network. If you were the owner of the very first fax machine, it was useless because you had no one to send a fax to. But as soon as you had a friend that had a fax machine, suddenly it becomes much more useful. When everyone has a fax machine, that's brilliant. It's the effect that works behind social networks as well. How many people here use Facebook, really, honestly? Probably uh, most of us because actually our friends and family are on it and we might not like using it, but there's a network effect there. The network effect we're making the use of is actually still a relatively small sample of these mobile devices providing us with that information. But if they do, they give us what I call situational superpowers. Suddenly, I have a capability that no human has because I can see off into the distance. I've got you know, my, my Superman X-ray vision. I can look hundreds of miles and find out what the traffic is like. I can look around the corner. I can, you know, in real time, work out how the traffic is flowing in, in any city. Now, this is not just in London, or Paris, or New York, or San Francisco. Literally anywhere on the planet now, we have this real-time traffic information. There are small islands in the Pacific where there are only two roads, but we still have information about how the traffic is flowing because there are users of mobile devices contributing that information. And if you ever use Google Maps uh, when you're driving, you'll see this See how it works. You'll see that the road in front of you might be, let's say, yellow because you've got slightly uh, more traffic than normal. But when you pull up to, say, a red traffic light, you'll see that the section of road you're on will turn red because you're contributing information to say, oh, well, actually, there's now congestion at this point. And that information is being shared then to other users of the network and saying, OK, there's congestion happening here. This has been around for a good few years now, well understood. We know how that works. But we're also seeing different ways of using this same feed of anonymous information about people's location to do other things as well. This is the, the local pub where I live in Teddington, southwest London. It's your typical sort of gastro pub, strange uh, decor perhaps, uh, if you're a traditional pub 
uh, lover. Um, and one of the things that, you know, I quite like it because it's usually quite quiet. You know, it's one of those places you can go, you can get a, a burger and chips and they'll serve it on a piece of slate as opposed to a plate, you know, a proper, proper um, gastro pub. And it's great when it's quiet. You can sit there and it's got good Wi-Fi. It's got some good beers on tap. Love it. I really hate it when the screens come down and they're then showing a football game or something. It gets really busy. And, you know, I have to admit that I'm not a great sports fan. I don't necessarily know when there's a sporting event on. But if I go to Google Maps and I swipe up uh, with the entry about the Teddington Arms, it will show me a little display that says, in real time, how busy is the pub at this point in time? Again, based on that sample data of people's mobile phones in the pub. And it will show me how busy is it relative to what the average has been over the last month or so at this time of day, how average is it usually? You see, when I was looking, it wasn't any more busy than I would expect to do at lunchtime. But if there'd been a, a game on, that would have been a much higher line, and I'd say, okay, I'll go somewhere else, or now's not the time. Last year, that same technology, that same process, we applied with the government of New South Wales to their bus routes. And obviously, their buses have uh, uh, real-time vehicle location on them, like many, many buses do now in cities. But in addition to that, we carried out an experiment to say, oh, okay, well, can we measure how busy the buses are? <clears throat> because we can compare this population of blue dots with where the bus is and the timetable of those buses, and then give people in Google Maps an estimate of how busy the bus is that's turning up at that location. So you, you could make the decision that, okay, well, this bus that's just arrived is really busy, but I know the next bus that's only a minute away is actually quite quiet, and I'll wait for that bus. That's actually a huge change. Again, it's reassuring for passengers to have that level of knowledge, that level of understanding, and it means people who are, again, much more likely to use these public transport systems if they have that knowledge that they won't necessarily have to wait at the bus stop for half an hour because all the buses are going to be full. Or if that is the case, they can make a conscious decision, they can make an informed decision and say, well, actually, that's not going to work. I'm going to use an alternative. I might even walk and get on a different bus route that's going to be quieter. So this is still experimental. We're just playing with these ideas in Sydney, but you can see the potential of this being rolled out more broadly. Also associated with this idea is the fact that actually the maps that we use today, we use them as much as we do because they are about us. Once upon a time in you know, cartography history, not that long ago, a few hundred years ago, the center of every map was Jerusalem because that was the most important place for society. So if you look at the old kind of map in Mondays and the old maps of the sort of medieval times and, and onwards. North wasn't the top of the map, actually. East was, Jerusalem was the center. Now, we have become the center of our own personalized maps. The maps that we look at on our mobile phones are personalized to us. They're individual to us. Today, if you use Google Maps, no two versions of Google Maps will be the same. Each of us, if we log in using our Google account information, will have a slightly different version of Google Maps. We could hold them up beside each other, and they'd be slightly different because they're customized to us based on some of our preferences, how we uh, move around, the things that we've searched for. Now, obviously, for this to work, you need to log in and choose to share information. And again, this is one of those policy issues, one of those societal issues that we need to work through. We need to be as transparent as we possibly can to say, okay, if you're sharing information with us, this is the information you're sharing and this is how we're going to use it. And to be honest with you, that's challenging for technology companies because we don't necessarily know how we might want to use that information next year. We might come up with new ideas, new innovations. We have to come back and ask you, OK, you said you wanted to share your information because we're going to do this, but actually we now want to do this. Are you OK with that? We need to work through those processes. 
But the key thing is to be completely transparent and say, OK, if you choose to share information, these are the things that we can give you in return, but also give you the option of saying, actually, no, I don't want to. Those things aren't valuable to me. I'm not going to share that information with you. Even though, potentially, there's a, there's a community good for sharing that information. It's like the vaccination debate. You know, vaccination works if everybody's vaccinated. If you have a big population that's not vaccinated, the process doesn't work as well. Now, I'm not drawing a comparison between getting vaccinated for the flu or measles and Google Maps. Completely different. Not making that. But in terms of you know, how networks and how populations work, something that we need to think about. If you're interested and you have used Google products in the past or you do use Google products, please visit myaccount.google.com. I advertise this every time I do a talk because it's really useful for you to go and see what Google knows about you. Everything we know about you is here. And if there's anything wrong, you can change it. If you're unhappy with what you're sharing, you can stop sharing. If you really are unhappy with us for some reason, you know, Ed was completely annoying on that lecture. I'm now going to stop using Google services. You can take all your data away and shut down your account. Completely up to you. I'm clearly not going to be that bad, I hope, in terms of the lecture, but you can. But once you get that personalization, once I'm sharing information on an individual basis, I can start to present information to you without you asking for it. So without you going to Google and typing in, this is the information I want to, to find out, I can say, present the information to you. So if I know that you commute by car, as soon as you get in your car and look at Google Maps, it can automatically present you with the information on your commute as it is today, at this point in time. Say, so, OK, I know where your home is, or I know where you are, I know where you work, I know how you choose to drive, and at the moment, if you in this case, me driving from Teddington into my office, it would take me just over an hour to drive. I would never really contemplate driving to work, but if I did, that's how long it would take me. And that figure will change in real time, depending upon the traffic conditions on the road network. And if there was major congestion, let's say, uh, for me, Trickenham Bridge was closed for whatever reason, I'd get a message that would pop up and say, hey, you're going to have to change your plans or leave earlier because your commute is now two hours, not the one hour it usually is. Actually, I tend to commute by train. So when I look at Google Maps, this is what I see. It tells me how Southwest Trains or Southwest Railway, I should say, is operating at this point in time from my local station uh, into Vauxhall, and then I'd get the tube up to King's Cross and it's telling me how that's operating. It's also telling me about the buses that I could take and how long that's going to take. Again, updated in real time, again presented to me without me having to ask because it knows that that's how I commute. And I provided that information to Google. I said, this is where I work. This is my home address. This is my choice. This is the way I prefer to, to travel. Even looking at Google Maps itself, Remember I said no two versions of Google Maps are the same. This is what I see if I look at Google Maps on the web um, for Brussels. And you can see uh, in the middle of Brussels, highlighted on the map there, it says uh, the courtyard by Brussels Marriott, uh, Marriott Brussels EU. So this is a hotel I'm staying at. And it's picked up from my Gmail a reservation for that particular hotel. And it's put it on my version of Google Maps. So when I look at Google Maps, I can see where my hotel reservation is. Anybody here Belgian? I can be rude about Brussels. I really don't like going to Brussels particularly. If anyone's got any better recommendations for hotels, please, uh, please tell me. But yeah, so that will be me next month off to Brussels once again. Some sympathy whenever that will be appreciated. OK, so. Let's go on then. Let's, let's develop that idea of ambient location a bit further. And you can see where that focus on the individual user, you can see how that is exposed in maps, and that kind of makes sense from a mobility point of view. But where location and ambient location 
ultimately is going to become much more powerful is where we think about, well, how can we develop services or products that use location and maybe present information in different ways and potentially change people's behavior? This is a really interesting topic. It's okay presenting people with information. I can say, well, your commute is going to take uh, 15 minutes longer than it would do. How about taking a different a route? How about taking the bus rather than taking the train? How about taking the Jubilee line rather than the Bakerloo line that you normally take? How do you change people's behavior when actually just presenting them with the information doesn't necessarily work? Because mostly we are creatures of habit and we like doing what we do. So this is about providing you know, different interfaces, different ways of presenting information. One of the areas that's going to be huge over the next couple of years are uh, what are called big games. And if you're wondering about this crowd of people in the image, this is a swarm, and that's apparently the technical term for this. This is a swarm of people playing Pokemon Go. How many people played Pokemon Go once upon a time? Big a couple of years ago. It was created by some ex-colleagues of mine who were uh, the guys originally behind parts of Google Maps. They went off and they uh, formed uh, Niantic Labs. Niantic Labs were the guys that created Pokemon Go. It's called a big game. It's something that is a game that people play in the neighborhoods. They go out and they explore the world around them. It's based on real-time content of uh, the world around you on which you overlay other information. So this is about, I suppose, the gamification of mobility, of commuting. What if, to get you to commute a different way, I provided you with points that you could use in your game? And you actually made commuting a game. And you could have you know, different ways of getting benefits, different ways of, of um, uh, winning in the game based upon how you commuted. And how you twist that set of rules, benefits, is something that an organization like TFL perhaps could, could modify. The toolkit for these sorts of applications is now available on most mobile phone platforms. So it's easy to build that interface between the real world and the virtual world and add that kind of gamification to what you're doing. So that's one interface, one way perhaps you could change the way that people thought about commuting. Here's another idea. This is contextual fiction. So this is an e-book that you download onto your Kindle or to your iPad. Um, and as you're reading this particular novel, a ghost story in this case, elements of the real world are inserted into the narrative of the story. So if it's raining in the real world, it will be raining in the scene that you're reading. If it's a cold day, it will be a cold day. If you're commuting, the protagonist is commuting. So bits of the story are being fed by what you're doing at that point in time. Now, if you're not plugged into your podcast or whatever else you're listening to on the, on the train, you'll find most people are looking at their screen, reading something, or doing some other activity. What if you could bring you know, this kind of mobility information into narrative, into stories, into the video that you're watching, again, potentially to change people's behavior, or at least to inform them with knowledge about their, their world around them so that they make those changes. They say, well, actually, you know, hey, that's a good idea. I will take the, the bus as opposed to taking my car today. And obviously, our interfaces to these information products are changing. These were the biggest sellers over the Christmas break. You know, almost, it seems almost everyone bought a smart speaker to have in their home, be it you know, Amazon Echo or the Google Home. We now you know, have to be very careful with our use of words at home that we don't automatically switch one of these things on and it starts up listening to us. So, you know, uh, I'm not sure if I've got any things that will... No, I'm okay. I can say, okay, Google, here. If I said it at home, about 15 speakers would light up and start listening to what I was saying because they want me to switch the lights on or whatever else. You know, Alexa's the same and Siri, they're all, they're all listening to. They're all, they all desperately want to be spoken to. But these, again, are personal devices. They sit in our homes. 
They know where they are. They know where we live. They know, again, <clears throat> because we're sharing uh, account information, they know about how we travel and the things that we're interested in. And people are increasingly finding it natural to have these uh, natural language interfaces. But the great way, again, of presenting information to you is via voice. You know, plugged into your headphones, listening to your music on your commute, you can have a little voice telling you, again, about what's going on around you, suggesting different ways to travel and so forth. Potentially, perhaps saying to you, okay, well, you know, today you can work from home for the next couple of hours because your commute's not going to be great. And actually, I can automatically reschedule the meeting that you had, email everyone that was going to go to that meeting and say, I'm going to be delayed. You can work from home. A lot of those tasks can be automated based upon the environment that you're working in to allow you to work much more flexibly. Now, I'm lucky I work for Google, and my job particularly means that wherever this is, is my office. I can communicate with all of the people in my team via this, via video conferencing. Actually, I mostly communicate with my team via messaging, via um, Google Hangouts or Slack channels. And actually, where I am is much less important than actually being connected and online and being able to be communicate with people. But having that much more sort of flexible approach tied to these technologies that can take over many of the, the boring management tasks that I would need to do to, to change my day more flexibly, again, I think can change the way that we move, change the way that we commute. To give you some examples of, of how this can work today, and where it's really interesting, is actually where these devices and similar devices actually talk to each other with no human intervention necessarily. So on my app, one of my apps I have on my phone um, connects to the lights I have in my home. I've got, um, overall I've got just under 100 devices connected to my uh, Wi-Fi router at home. A big chunk of those are lights that are connected to Wi-Fi. So when I'm approaching home, my lights will automatically switch on because obviously there's no point having lights on if there's nobody home. And likewise, I can leave home without having to remember to switch off the lights because they will switch themselves off based upon the fact that my device is sharing its location automatically with the service that controls the lights. I don't have to intervene. It's doing this automatically. And, but I can ask it to also, if I'm away for an extended period of time overnight to switch the lights on and off randomly to simulate someone being at home as well. My lights are also connected to my smoke detectors. And they will come on automatically if my smoke detector uh, is triggered. It flashes red lights. It scares the rest of the family to be Jesus. But you know everyone is going to get up because these devices are connected. Likewise, I've got my thermostat that controls my central heating. I can look now on my phone and tell you what my temperature of my house is at home. And I know, will know that at the moment it's going to be about 12 degrees because that's the temperature I set my house when there's nobody home. It knows there's nobody home because this and all of the smoke detectors that it's connected to have proximity sensors in them and can sense if there's anyone at home. And they have a sensitivity setting so that the cats I have at home don't set them off. So it knows that no one's home. When I start to come, come home this evening, again, my phone will automatically talk to my uh, heating system and say, hey, Ed's on his way home. He's about half an hour away from home now. Let's start heating the house for when Ed gets home. Just having these devices talking to each other automatically without me being involved in the process saves me about 5% of my energy bill every year. That easily covers the costs of these devices. But think of the other potential of having these devices location aware, networked, talking to each other, minimizing the amount of energy that I use, hopefully you know, making those processes much more straightforward and easy as we move forward. OK, next step then. Here come the machines. Those smart devices that we have in our homes 
use a very simple form of, of uh, machine learning, AI, to recognize our voices. It's not that difficult a task. We've been able to do that for quite a long time, so we can have conversations with these devices. Where there's a huge potential in machine learning is actually taking the capabilities of these algorithms to recognize data, to recognize patterns, and create new data sets, and base decisions on those data sets. This is uh, Google Maps of the city of Lagos in Nigeria, circa about 2012. And that doesn't look bad. You know, they've got loads of streets on there and a few buildings. Uh, obviously, it doesn't look quite as, as full as London or Tokyo. But, you know, as maps of Africa went, that was pretty good. There are no equivalent maps from, you know, the equivalent of the Nigerian Ordnance Survey that are available for us to go and and, and um, get the information from and digitize and so forth. So what we did was to take an approach and said, let's use all the satellite imagery that we've acquired, apply machine learning algorithms to that satellite imagery and see if we can't automate the process of cartography, capturing content features from those images. And this is the result of applying machine learning to that data set. Suddenly we can now identify every building in the city completely automatically. We can do that for the whole planet. We can identify the roofs of every building everywhere, applying a machine learning algorithm to the data that we already have. Suddenly makes those maps much fuller, allows us to offer those same services that we have here in London or Paris or San Francisco to people in Nigeria or wherever they might be. Of course, you'll be very familiar with autonomous vehicles. There is a point of view that autonomous vehicles are largely restricted by the availability of large-scale geospatial data. That's not actually the case, because these are mostly examples of sensors and machine learning applied to the output of those sensors. Let me just show you a video um, of one of these vehicles driving. So what you'll see uh, as this vehicle drives along uh, is what it's sensing. So it'll pull up to the... Um, uh, stoplight here and then it will drive on and you'll see the sensors. These have been driving the streets of California for probably about five years or so now, gathering large volumes of data. And what they work uh, from is short-range radar, so the sorts of things you might have on a parking sensor in your car, and on the top, that little black thing is a scanning LiDAR sensor. So it's scanning around the route and identifying uh, by light bouncing off features, things that are nearby it. So the sensors are the real magic to this. It's sensing where things are relative to the vehicles as it's driving along. Where the machine learning comes in is taking all of that sensor input and turning the input into features. They're saying, OK, that's a traffic light. Uh, you know, these are cars pulling out. And what should I do as a vehicle when I see those things? How should I react? In the same way that we learn to drive. We learn to drive by taking what we visually see, processing that, and recognizing what's around us. So autonomous vehicles are doing that. They are recognizing the world around them recognizing that a red stoplight means that you should stop, recognizing that a, a, someone on a bicycle uh, is going to behave in a particular way. That's what allows us to do the autonomous vehicles. The autonomous vehicles potentially allows us to radically change the way that cities look today. And it's driven by two numbers, the logic behind this. The first of these numbers is the cars that we buy, we spend an awful lot of money on buying cars in, in the West. You know, after buying a house, a car's the most expensive thing you'll buy. That really expensive thing you buy spends 95% of its time parked, not doing anything. It's parked outside your house, it's parked inside a car park somewhere. You've invested all of that money, you're paying a really big lease, you're paying a higher purchase agreement for something that most of the time you're not using. That doesn't make sense. The other figure that's interesting is 30% of the land and structures in our city are built around the storage of those cars that are not moving around doing anything. 
So we have car parks, we have uh, the side of the road that we use to park our cars on. That's space that we could use much more productively if we didn't have these cars sitting around not doing anything most of the time. If you have autonomous vehicles that you can pretty much call on demand and they come and do what you need, why would you ever buy one? In uh, Phoenix, in Arizona, we're rolling out a experimental service that works a bit like Uber, in that you can call up a vehicle, say where you want to go, using your app, and the vehicle will turn up, you get in the car, and it takes you where you want to go, and you pay just using the app. And if you like, you can talk to the driver, in the same way if you like, you can talk to your Uber driver. The only difference here is that the driver is just sitting there for safety reasons. The car is autonomous. It's driving itself. Actually, it's a bit embarrassing for the driver. So you, have to kind of, you almost have to have a conversation because they're just sitting there uh, not doing anything. But this is a real example. This isn't theoretical. This isn't something that's going to happen in 10 years' time. This is something that's happening today in Phoenix. You can download the app if you're there and do it. You can call up a Waymo vehicle, it will come pick you up and drive you somewhere else. <clears throat> now, clearly, these vehicles are still very expensive. The sensing technology, the onboard computing power means that you know, these are the things you're not going to buy, probably not in the short term. But actually, why would you buy one? Why would you buy one that is going to sit outside your house 95% of the time. If I can reliably call one up on my app and it will take me where I want to go at a low cost, because the most expensive thing in most taxi operations is the driver, if don't have the driver, it suddenly becomes much cheaper. It suddenly changes the way that we think about cities. It might take cities back to what they looked like in the 1950s. This is the high street of Teddington, where I live, in the 1950s. And the first thing that you see and what immediately jumps out at you is, well, where are the cars? It's because car ownership was much lower then. The whole morphology of cities was very different. It's only really been the last 50 years where cities have suddenly become dominated by cars. And maybe that's something that is temporary. There may be a future that's very accessible to us with these technology changes that reduce the car ownership, that means that we will have fewer cars. Now, this isn't a replacement for mass transport systems. Mass transport systems are still really important. They're still the most efficient way of moving peoples around the city. But if we can get those cars off the road, it radically changes the landscape. And that doesn't mean that we haven't forgotten the most common way that people communicate, or people commute around London, at least all of us will use this as some form of a part of our commute, and that's walking. And we can develop services that help you when you're navigating on foot. It turns out, surprise, surprise, that when you navigate on foot, actually you need different types of information, and you need that information presented to you in different ways. I'll, I'll be really honest with you, Google Maps doesn't work that well if you're a pedestrian. The technology that we have in terms of locating where you are doesn't work that well. You all have that problem, I'm sure. You get out the tube station, don't you? You get out the tube station, you pull out your phone, and then you go, ah. And then you go, ah, no, that's not right. I need to go this way. Who's done that? Yeah, we've all done that. That immediate location, where you are, and which direction you're facing, we call that your pose, is a really difficult problem to solve because actually the GNSS in our phone doesn't work that well in built-up areas. And the main problem is that the magnetic, the compass, the electronic compass in these devices gets messed up by any form of EM radiation around it. So it's kind of hard to work out which direction you're facing. But what we can do is take that machine learning understanding that we've got from those autonomous vehicles, and we can hold our phone up and get our phone to recognize the landscape, to recognize the buildings in any particular area, and then orientate ourselves very accurately. If I can orientate myself accurately, I can then present direction information 
much more excitingly. So, your directions are now given to you by your friendly fox, that all you need to do is to follow the fox, and the fox will tell you where you need to go. That's fun, more gamification, perhaps getting you to walk a little bit more. Uh, again, you know, this is fun. We're still experimenting with this sort of technology, and we're experimenting with you know, what animals should you have. Maybe you could buy your favorite you know, cat or whatever, and you could follow that. Um, but it's looking at you know, all of those challenges of mobility in the city, recognizing the fact that, hey, not everyone drives. Okay. That said, this is really interesting. Making a better driver. In London, in the Google offices, we uh, also are the HQ to DeepMind. And DeepMind is, in effect, Google's uh, research arm in terms of uh, deep learning and AI. And they do all sorts of different research projects of where they can apply what they've learned from machine learning to solve different problems. One of the things they started looking at uh, a couple of years ago was this. This is a London taxi driver. And I'm sure most of you will understand uh, the process of becoming a London taxi driver is unique and arcane and a bit special. So a London taxi driver, to be a London taxi driver, has to learn what's known as the knowledge, the knowledge of London. And the knowledge of London is a selection of routes from different points across London that you have to be able to uh, regurgitate without any mistakes, saying, OK, if I need to get from uh, Waterloo to King's Cross, I need to go across Waterloo Bridge and give every piece of directions as you drive uh, along that route. And you can't make any mistakes, and you'll be tested randomly on these routes by your examiner. And if you don't pass, and most people don't pass for the first time, you have to start the process again. And you will see these guys, knowledge boys, running around, uh, learning the different routes. And the best way to learn the routes is to jump on a moped and actually drive the routes yourself. Because as you're navigating, what you're doing is you're picking up information uh, about the world around you, you know, the landmarks, the things that you pass. Taxi drivers actually have a larger hippocampus. They are much better at spatial reasoning than the normal population because they've had to learn the knowledge. What the pesky people at Deep, Learning, at Deep Mind said was, can we replicate that? Can we replicate the process of learning the knowledge? How does that work? So I'm just going to show you a, a short video of the process of doing that, learning to navigate in cities without a map. And what we did was, rather than get people to drive on mopeds, we took all of the street view imagery we had, and we fed that to machine learning algorithms. And what we're doing here is we're not learning, and this is a key point, we're not learning how to navigate any specific city. What we're learning to do is to learn how to navigate in a generic sense. How do we as humans navigate. It turns out, unsurprisingly perhaps, a lot of it is based upon landmarks and recognizing landmarks from the image. So what we've been able to do is to create this neural network, an agent-based network that can navigate around the city just in a matter of you know, a few moments by being presented with all the images of, of actually recognizing that process. So it's something that we can do. We can get a navigation around the city, and it looks bizarre because part of it is going backwards, but that's just the way that the, the images are captured. But we can work out how we can explore a city just using machine learning. Now, you heard that I'm a lapsed pilot. My midlife crisis was learning how to fly light aircraft. And it was a true midlife crisis thing. Uh, completely impractical. You know, it's it's more expensive to fly my little Cessna anywhere in London, anywhere in the UK. It's going to be more expensive to fly that than it will be to go EasyJet or bus or anything. It just makes no economic sense whatsoever. But it was still fun to learn. And it took a lot of time. It took the um, best part of probably two years of me going out every weekend to do a few hours flying and I had to pass eight separate exams on various aspects of flight law and so on. It's fun to do, 
And I would recommend it. It's interesting. But if I wanted to fly my Cora, it makes little sense if I had to be a private pilot's license. So Cora, this electrically powered flying taxi uh, developed by Kitty Hawk, a, a company that many of the founders of Google have invested in, is semi-autonomous in that a lot of the, the really difficult piloting skills are automated. So you can drive this pretty much if you can play a computer game. Now, yes, at this point in time, you do have to be a trained pilot because you know, we're still learning how to do this. And this is only flying in New Zealand where the regulatory framework is much easier. But it is something that easily, conceptually, you can see being completely automated. Now, again, I'm not suggesting that this is a, um, a real solution for transport in London. But it's not just you know, crazy startups funded by you know, Google founders that are doing this. Yesterday, uh, Boeing flew their first uh, semi-autonomous flying vehicle. And you know, Boeing's pretty serious about this sort of thing. These are not a fly-by-night company. They're not wasting stuff and wasting money on things that they think are not going to go anywhere. It's an interesting technical challenge. But it's a technical challenge that fundamentally is grounded in there being a much richer source of information to make these things operate. And that's the key point I'm making. We can do a lot to radically change the way that we move around our cities by using information. So my final thought, to give us time for some questions. So once upon a time, well, actually not that long ago, much of our knowledge and our insight and a view of technology, how it might impact us, was something that really happened in laboratories. Much of the modern world from an IT perspective actually came from this place. This is the Xerox Park, the Palo Alto Research Center uh, in Palo Alto in California, where computer networking, mice, uh, the user interface that we all use in our computers were all developed in this place by very bright people. What's fundamentally different today is the tools that allow us to create different solutions to solving the world's problems around us are now much more accessible than ever before. We don't have to be sitting in a big research center like Xerox Park to solve big problems. And I'm going to finish off presenting you with an example of that, these are some undergraduate students who are solving a problem that is a real problem um, just using their laptops. Hello, my name is Alejandra. And I'm Ericsson. And we're using machine learning to find potholes on the streets of Los Angeles. LA has over 7,400 miles of roads and freeways. That's a lot of roads and a lot of potholes to fix. Right now, construction workers have to manually inspect roads for dangerous potholes and cracks, or rely on people calling in tips, which takes a lot of time. While studying at LMU, we started to see if we could figure out a faster way to identify potholes throughout the city. First, we needed data. So we rigged a camera to a car, and we drove around to capture footage of different roads and freeways. Then, we used TensorFlow, Google's open source machine learning tool, to develop a model that could quickly identify potholes, road cracks, and other weird stuff with a high rate of accuracy. Which means workers can spend less time finding potholes and more time fixing them. So that's an undergraduate project that can potentially now develop a service that will allow you to go and find where the potholes are and potentially fix them much more quickly but just using a laptop and a GoPro camera suction cupped onto the front of your car. You don't need to be Xerox Park. But that said, Xerox Park has some great minds, and this, I will finish off with this great quote. The most profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they are indistinguishable from it. That's what information is all about. It's about supplementing our lives. From a mobility point of view, it's about supplementing our lives when we're moving around. Information becomes that infrastructure that allows us to act and operate differently. We can plug into that nervous system of the world around us. 
And it means, and I hope it means, that we can spend our money more wisely, not build big, expensive new infrastructure projects where, for a lot less money, we can make much more use of the infrastructure we already have. And on that point, I shall thank you very much. That was a, a really, really interesting and exciting view of how we can actually use and play with and, and learn from information and, and the vitality that comes from being able to do that and the opportunities that come. What a challenge for transport in the future. So, do we have some questions? Please. So uh, you spoke a bit about policies in your presentation. I'd be really curious to know, are there any tangible policies that you think that government can enact to effectively get out of the way of technology and enable quicker uh, geotech development? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, the, actually the government's already doing some quite good things in terms of, of you know, data sharing and you know, the potential work of the, the Geospatial Commission here in the UK trying to get various government agencies to get their act it together in terms of sharing information. Certainly, you know, many of the products and services that we have here in London uh, work well because organizations like TfL are sharing their information and making that available. So that's, that's really helpful. I think where the, there are challenges are around this idea of, of you know, community sharing information and how do we um, build mechanisms that will allow people to, to do that with control and trust but at the same time, not put in place um, mechanisms that prevent that from working well. And I think that's a, that's a balance you know, within the context of GDPR. We still need to understand quietly how that works. And it's you know, probably just going to be a matter of time for us to kind of work our way through that and work out what does it actually mean. Uh, but I think you know, really important to this idea of information as an infrastructure is that focus on the individual of us all contributing information to the, to the good of the community. Okay, uh, please. So you're focusing on the individual and you're providing alternative routes in congested conditions. But of course you're providing information to whole populations of individuals. So what are you doing, if anything, to optimize across the system? And are you collaborating with the road authorities, the transport undertakings, to ensure the system is optimized? That's a really good question, and it's something that we probably naively fell into. Specifically, the, the motivator for us was um, an application that sits beside Google Maps called Waze. I don't know how many of you have used it. It came from a, a, very, um, a very exciting and efficient Japanese, uh, Israeli startup that we acquired. Waze works by crowdsourcing uh, information. It's very popular. Uh, with taxi drivers, because it's very good at giving you the rat runs that will take you, you know, down the residential roads. That worked very well for a period of time until the people that lived on those rat runs suddenly recognized that all of these cars now driving down their road are being directed that way by way. So what we're doing, and we're still finding our way with this, is we're working with those local communities to try and balance that so that, okay, if there are maybe four or five parallel streets that are rat runs, can we distribute the traffic equally along those routes so the driver gets a shorter route, but also it doesn't mean that the, the utility for those people that live as, as residents on those streets is impacted too much. It's, it's trying to balance that. And to be honest, we're still learning. We're still understanding how that works. And clearly there's a, there's a role for, you know, for policymakers in that space. But it's you know, it's still very much emerging. I think most policy uh, makers probably haven't come to terms with the fact that, you know, this information is being connect collected in the way that it is. Hi there. Uh, fascinating stuff. Thank you. Um, can I just ask you about the, the self-driving cars thing? You, you were saying that the machine learning on board the car is much more important than, the, than the, the mapping data that the car is using, which just seems odd when you've got the best maps in the world and other self-driving car companies are you know, climbing over each other trying to build up those maps. So can you just say a bit more about how you balance those two things? 
Yeah, a very, very insightful question. Actually, there are, there are, there are two, two schools of thought. One school of thought is about high-definition high maps of the world, and you use those to uh, navigate a car through. So the car is continually um, comparing its model of the world with what it sees from this high-definition map, that, what the world's meant to look like. Um, and yeah, to a certain extent, you need the, the other school of thought, which is the one that we, I guess, Waymo are, are more behind, is that actually you just sense the world around you as you drive it, and actually you, you throw the data away as soon as you've driven down that particular route. Um, I guess why me personally, and I think why Waymo um, focus more on the, the truly autonomous sense, is that it is autonomous. It doesn't rely on that connectivity to other networks to tell it about the road conditions, and it means that the vehicle will always be able to navigate um, without any access to any other networks or any other sources of information. It uses GPS in the same way that we would use GPS just to navigate to get from A to B. The process of driving is a completely separate task. Now, we don't drive by you know, matching a, a, a semantic model or a, a, a model of the world in our head with what we see in the real world. That's a different task. That's navigation. So we separate driving from navigation. The other route is to say, that, well, they're all the same thing. And you know, I'm not saying that that's necessarily the wrong approach, but that's not the approach that we're following. Thanks. <clears throat> I trust an ordnance survey map because <coughs> the ordnance survey map has been around. <coughs> the ordnance survey has been around for a couple of hundred years. Mm -hmm. uh, it's provided by an agency of the state, and it's actually once it's been printed, it's quite difficult to corrupt it. Yeah. Do you want me to entrust my life to the system in which you are describing here, in a world that is full of criminals and charlatans and trolls and pranksters? And this all happened at Gatwick before Christmas. How I can be confident that I'm being protected? from all those malign interests that were serving purposes quite alien to mine? Yeah. Um, that's a very good question. I think where there is risk of, of life in terms of you know, navigation systems and you know, the autonomous vehicles that we were talking about, we need to harden those systems so that as much as we possibly can, there is no external influence in the way they work. That's slightly different to the navigation piece. The navigation piece, you're dealing with um, less canonical data, if we're honest. Much of it is, is um, sourced by various agencies, many of which are beyond their control. So that data, by its very nature, is going to be less reliable. But actually, for the applications, the problems you're trying to solve, it's still fit for purpose. It's very nice that you have such uh, trust in ordnance survey data and ordnance survey maps. And for similar reasons, you know, that mapping data is very fit for purpose for particular tasks. But even it has limitations. There are features in all ordnance survey maps that are put in there for um, protection of copyright. That means the maps contain um, inbuilt systematic errors. They won't impact in your use of them, but they're not necessarily as accurate as you might imagine them to be. And they're certainly not as accurate in terms of uh, currency because of the publishing process that they use. You know, they don't give you that real-time view of the world. So it's a balance of you know, what sort of information do you use for particular tasks. Now going back to my example as the lapsed, avi lapsed aviator, to fly and be legal in the UK, you have to have a paper chart uh, published by the CAA inside your aircraft as a backup. But most private pilots will have an, an iPad velcroed to their, their cockpit using a GPS application, uh, something like SkyDemon, and that's what most people use. The paper map is a backup. And I think we'll end up with a, a similar sort of circumstances where you'll have you know, reliable trusted data that it's harder to input and harder to uh, um, manipulate as a backup source, but real-time data coming from the network 
that we use most of the time. And we balance the risk of using those different data sets depending upon the application. Thank you, Ed, for this insightful presentation. Um, Clement Scavoli, Center for Transport Studies. You, you mentioned the um, on-demand way more um, self-driving cars in parts of the U.S. Uh, so I, I, I suspect this is going to be a, probably a long-term um, investment for, for Google. Now, you um, know, I'm sure, that one of uh, Google Maps competitors, CityMapper, has been using data from its users to, to actually create um, on-demand responsive minibuses and they, they um, trial that in, in London. Has Google considered doing something similar with minibuses or, or buses? And if so, what are the plans, if you can reveal that to us? Thank you. Very good question. So. Um, we don't have any current plans to do the equivalent of the kind of on-demand buses that the city mapper have experimented with. We, we have done and we do occasional experiments with various forms of car sharing and, and building applications around that. We are very much interested in that on-demand transport model. And it's something that we do experiment with. We look at the challenges. We try to see if there are ways where information can optimize things. Um, there are no products or services that we can announce, but it is definitely something that is interesting uh, because, again, it's something that you know, fundamentally we can change potentially the way buses work with that much greater knowledge of demand. You know, it's, you know, it's a very you know, old-fashioned way, you know, timetabling buses that run every 10 minutes throughout the day you know, that doesn't have any balance to demand, which you know, has clearly driven... Uh, you know, the business models of Uber and Waymo and so on, where it's much more, you know, uh, transport on demand. So we're looking at it. it. There are some experiments, but there's nothing to announce. I would probably spend, and this is a finger in the air, I would spend probably five million on putting uh, Wi-Fi and cellular repeaters on the tube network. I think that would make a huge difference uh, to how we use the network, how we consume information as we're traveling. Um, I think it would all make us more informed travelers and probably would just uh, improve everyone's um, uh, happiness by just giving them a access to the network when they're on a tube train. Or well, actually, if I'm honest, just making sure that you get connectivity on your phone when you're traveling on suburban trains, because even the 3G, 3G signal is pretty rubbish on my route. Thank you, that was really interesting. Um, you obviously work globally. Where do you think the UK sits in terms of current geospatial policy and uptake and innovation and crowdsourcing and the quality of data? Um, I, I, know, I think we're, we're in many ways leading, certainly from a crowdsourcing point of view. You know, programs, projects like OpenStreetMap started here. They started actually you know, in this institution, uh, was the, the founder of OpenStreetMap. Uh, so I think that's a great example of, of crowdsourcing, building a you know, editable map of the world that, that people can contribute to. Um, I think, as I said, you know, the work of, of TfL after a slow start, they've, they've really um, picked up, particularly, you know, I suppose, influenced by uh, the open data movement here in the UK. The ODI, I think, has been very influential in, in moving that forward. Um, I think perhaps where we're a little bit behind the curve is in that provision of, of information and, and smart sort of applications to, to sort of close the loop. You know, so we can gather information about how people are commuting. But if we could offer, say, you know, different uh, pricing models uh, to uh, change the way that commuters act based on you know, real-time information on the network, that's something that 
you know, I think, you know, TfL would be well positioned to do because they got much of that information. It's just a case of thinking differently around the problem. So I think we're, we're actually quite good from a policy point of view. We're not perhaps so good at thinking outside the box for different types of solutions. Hi. Um, I'm interested in, you showed Lagos and the, the pattern of movement. I'm sure that Lagos, similar to a project I worked on and the largest city in North Yorkshire, um, is similar in that a lot of the footpath routes are through allotments, across the cemeteries, through on the fence. My biggest omission on Google Maps is I don't get that information. Is there a chance that that will happen? I'm thinking on from that. I see a fantastic link between that and TfL's new approach to healthy streets that currently involves some judgment, but which could lend itself very well to artificial intelligence, I would think. Yeah, no, that's a very good question. Um, to be honest, there's nothing in the short term, but, but we do recognize that we need to do a better job for pedestrian navigation across the board. So I mentioned you know, some of the things that we're doing with that augmented reality application. I mean, I can't announce it, but we certainly do look at things like desire lines, which, you know, the, the way that you choose to walk across an open space, um, not constrained by the, the pathways that are there necessarily, because we can capture that information, again, anonymously from tracking people's mobile phones. So we could do a much better job of that, and, you know, we know some of the low-hanging fruit to do that better, and, you know, I, I do promise we are going to do you know, over the medium term, a better job of pedestrian navigation than we do at the moment. But I, you know, I can't promise you we'll, we'll solve that one. But it's definitely something on the radar screen. Okay, I mean, I'm just wondering, following on from that, whether um, when you do that, you would be saying to somebody, instead of actually choose this route or that route run or, or these different routes in a, in a car or on a bus or whatever, actually, you know what, you should actually walk this way. Yeah. And that, and and use that kind of information to start to influence even whether a journey is made in, at all. I mean. Exactly, and I think, you know, I think really that is the big challenge for us, is, is how do you move from providing information to actually influencing the decisions that people make? And actually, do we have a role in doing that? You know, there's, there's the certainly line of argument that says, well, actually, we should just provide the information, and then it's up to the individual how they, they use that information. But then, of course, the flip side, the other argument of that is that the benefit for the population as a whole comes from us all as individuals changing our behavior to, to give that maximum benefit. I don't, I don't have the answer. You know, there, are, there are sort of hints and technology pieces that we can use to potentially you know, influence, change people's behavior. Uh, but hey, you know, we need some research. You know, we need to be told what to do by some friendly academics that can help come us. come to the right place. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Ed, fantastic. Thank you ever so much. My I pleasure. think you've given us all lots of things to think about. Thank you.